the beginning of the Jewish month of Av, and in particular its ninth day, have been throughout history a very ominous time. On the ninth of Av, extending to the tenth, both of our temples were destroyed, the verdicts to expel Jews from England in 1290 and from Spain in 1492 were issued, the First World War that would later culminate in the Holocaust began, in addition to innumerable other tragedies, such as more than 8,500 Jews getting forcefully thrown out of Gaza in a disengagement operation that would backfire soon after. Our sages tell us that if a Jew has a legal case with a non-Jew during the month of Av, he should try to postpone it to a more auspicious time because he will not succeed. The sages also warn about traveling during this time because the Jewish people is more exposed to danger and harm in this period. It is therefore no surprise that the Arabs occupying the Temple Mount and vast areas in the land of Israel are often able to cause us trouble in this vulnerable time. But from the Shabbat following the ninth day and on, begins a brighter stage in the Jewish calendar with the promise of a great consolation. All the observant Jews have just finished a hard fast in the midst of the hottest summer season with the recent Temple Mount crisis at least superficially behind us and with a deep wound of another sadistic and inhuman attack on a Jewish family leaving three dead. All the nation is prepared to turn a new page waiting eagerly for the salvation ahead. But the salvation hasn't even begun. We are forced to hear that another shame parade is to take place on the streets of Holy Jerusalem. And where are we? Where are all the faithful Jews when an enormous tidal wave of impurity floods the abode of our living God? Besides a small number of concerned and dedicated individuals, namely the Lehava activists, there is no one to raise a cry over this obscenity. If we could sum them up, half a million or even a hundred thousand or even fifty thousand for a counter-protest, the city would call the whole charade off. But no one wants to hear, no one wants to know, no one wants to take it to heart. But God hears, God sees, and God pays back in full. And being unable to do much to stop this, I make my small protest and pray that by doing this, I myself will have washed my hands and the hands of my family members clean. And I pray that God will hold back his retribution until a great number of people have repented either for having, having participated in the event itself or for organizing it or for having sat indifferent to this desecration of God's holy name. One might argue and ask, is this really worth making a protest against? Is it really that bad? They parade downtown and whoever doesn't wish to be exposed to it can stay home and by tomorrow it's all over. The problem is that the Jews, besides being punished or rewarded according to each individual's individual sins or accomplishments, are being punished or rewarded also for the sins or accomplishments of the nation as a whole. Our sages tell us a parable of a man traveling on a boat. All of a sudden, the co-passengers see water seeping out of his private living quarters. Worried, they immediately knock on the door and ask what is happening. The man tells him that he is drilling holes into the floorboards. They cry out to him and inquire whether the man's gone insane. He might sink the whole ship. To this the man responds calmly, What I do in my private quarters is no one else's business. These people, the crusaders of lust as I like to call them, don't have a problem of drilling holes into the floorboards of our already leaking boat just because they seem to be incapable of controlling their sexual instinct. Why is this primitive display of immorality called a pride, when in fact all who partake in it are deep down shamefaced? Why? After all, we live in a modern time and in a Western society where the perpetrators usually have more rights than their victims and where everything ugly is called beautiful. Because of a thing called conscience, everyone coming out of their dark closets still hear a muffled voice telling them, that what they are doing is inherently wrong. So, in order to silence that voice, one needs to mingle with a big crowd. And it needs to be called a pride, because if a person lies to oneself enough, eventually they'll come to believe it. And why did I choose to call it primitive? Because if you call it modern, 
all one needs to do is to open up a Bible and see what the people of Sodom were engaged in and what became their end over three and a half thousand years ago. It reads in the first book of Moshe that all the men young and old came to Lot demanding that the wayfarers he had just housed be brought out to them so that they could have their way with them. One should ask an obvious question. Was it really all the men of the city that were entangled in homosexuality? In reality, like most countries today, Sodom didn't turn wicked overnight. It started with more minor things such as temporary dis distortion of law and justice that eventually led to more serious crimes. Slowly but surely, bigger and bigger transgressions were overlooked and eventually things that had previously been considered abom abominable turned first into something tolerable, and in the end it was enforced by law, whereas honesty and virtue were outlawed. Criminals had more rights than people trying to protect themselves, like, for instance, today, in Israel where a terrorist can slaughter anyone almost freely, but the soldiers shooting to protect themselves and to save others are being prosecuted. But like us, Saddam also had a supreme court, or as I like to call it, a supremely low court, where the so-called judges similarly took their man-made, twisted law book to fight God's word and any <clears throat> anything decent in favor of the corrupt and ruthless. Likewise, these paraders, backed up by the mayor and the city's representatives who are afraid of losing their precious seats should they voice out against this, come and let loose here in Jerusalem, on the excuse of human rights. But what about the human rights of those who live here? of those who have to lock themselves up for a day to protect themselves and their families against witnessing a vulgar display of perversity that's out in the open. When a man gives up fear of heaven, he runs into a problem. The atheist philosophers struggle to find an answer to the impossible question, how to define morality. They claim that societies free of God and his word are qualified to set the standard to what is considered moral behavior and action. But as time goes by and demand arises, that standard can be negotiated. Years ago, things such as an abortion would have never gotten approved by a society governed by religious law, even a faulty religious law, such as that of Christianity's. And today, a couple's or a single mother's mood can determine whether a child lives or dies. In Judaism, an abortion is made in a case where the mother herself would be in a mortal danger, but in a society deprived of any fear of anything greater than a man himself, even a question of life and death can be overridden by a plea for convenience. A society that not only allows rampant abortions and same-sex marriages, but in fact promotes them in addition to encouraging birth control and family planning, is signing its own death warrant. In particular, Europe, with a close to zero population growth, with enormous refugee quotas from Muslim countries in addition to widespread conversion to Islam and a high fertility rate amongst the Muslims, can farewell the all Western valueless values in the coming decades as Europe is slowly but indefinitely turning Islamic. Not to mention the threat of terror for which Europe is entirely unprepared. But God pays nations according to their deeds, and the sun is about to set permanently upon the Western world and the remnants of its natural order. All the nations on earth have been given laws and statutes to uphold. The Jewish people, as representatives of God, have to keep more commandments than the rest of the people, but a few basic laws everyone shares. And amongst them, there are three prohibitions a Jewish person is told to give up their lives for rather than to transgress them, especially if they are being forced to perform them against their will. They are murder, idol worship and illicit sexual relationships under which homosexual relations surely fall under. And since the parade is taking place in Jerusalem, the assumption is that there are many Jews who are also involved in this despicable display and the vast majority of them do not follow any of the decrees that they as Jews are meant to keep. Because if they would, they would not be found anywhere near such an event, unless they've joined a counter-protest against it. And unfortunately, these Jews have changed 
the true Jewish bride to an artificial one and thus, even if they were a kippah on their heads and even if they were a star of David necklace around their necks, there's not much Jewish left. Because having been recruited in the army of God to be a light unto the nations and they have fallen to the dark side along with the great maturity of the world, thus casting off all principles of the Jewish faith as defined by our holy teacher Rambam. But even for a Jew who has fallen short of his mission, there is nothing keeping them from returning to the truth, if only they would realize the futility of the cheap pleasures of this transcending world. So let it be my prayer that all Jews should return to the loving embrace of our Creator, and then our Holy Land will once again be elevated from the deep depths it has fallen into.